All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Catherine Herman at her home in Carlton. It's August 19th, 2021. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, biggest question, first question, as you know, why wine? Well, first of all, thank you so much for joining me here today. It's really exciting to be a part of this archive, and I'm a huge fan of all of the work that you all do, and I've watched a number of episodes, so I, I did anticipate this question. Um, so I think um, for me, my journey has not been a straight line to the wine industry. I feel so happy and blessed to be here, but um, the most immediate reason for me why wine is that I, I married a guy, Chris Herman, he has a great interview in the archive that you shot recently, who is uh, completely obsessed with wine. And um, he's from a fantastic European family and I really appreciate their heritage and everything they've done for the state of Oregon and the respect that they have for the great wines of the world. So, um, you know, I grew up in rural New England. Wine drinking was not a part of my family, um, but you know, I'll get into my path and how I really got out here to Oregon in the Willamette Valley. But um, I met Chris in late 2014 and I was drinking, um, I think a really terrible glass of wine at the Irving Street Kitchen in downtown Portland. I think it was like an Italian Pinot Grigio by the glass pour with my girlfriends. And um, he told me that he could, he could help me out with that <laughs> and maybe introduce me to something a little bit better, um, namely Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. And um, you know, Chris and I moved in together and fell in love in the middle of 2015. And his father, now my father-in-law, Richard Herman, was um, alive at the time. And we all lived in the same condominium building in downtown Portland on different floors. And I love the fact that um, Chris and his father were very close and ate every meal together, um, breakfast, lunch when they were able to, and dinner. So as I became an immediate part of the family, um, they welcomed me with open arms and we spent many, many evenings around the dinner table learning about the great wines of the world, but also Chris's family and his heritage and their food culture at the same time. Um, so for me personally, falling in love with the Willamette Valley and falling in love with wine coincided with really following, falling in love with Chris and his family. Mm -hmm. So um, you can't really untangle that whole story. It's all, it's all one for me, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about life before wine a little bit. You mentioned kind of your path here. So growing up in rural New England, tell me about kind of upbringing and uh, education, early life. Yeah, so I grew up in a town uh, very small, as many of them are in New England, called Freiburg, Maine. And it's on the border of Maine and New Hampshire in the Mount Washington Valley. Um, my maiden name is Brown, and so my family is very interested in genealogy. So uh, we've recently traced our family back to the first gentleman, Thomas Brown, who came to the New World in 1609. Um, so that's very cool. So from Thomas Brown landing in Massachusetts until present day, um, my family is still living in Maine and Massachusetts. Um, so the fact that I sort of broke free from the brood and, and came out to the other Portland is still kind of shocking to them. <laughs> um, but I, I grew up loving and living in nature. So for me, living in the natural world was not a vacation on the weekends. I really grew up living and, and being a part of it. So I grew up hunting, ice fishing, cross country skiing, and uh, I come from a very large family on both sides. So I had, I think I have 20 to 30 cousins. Um, so the adults were always very happy to put us on our bicycles and tell us to come back in eight hours for dinner. Um, so I had a lot of freedom in the, the natural world. And I never thought about this when I was growing up, but I really think that's how I, trained my palate for wine because in this world we have I think eight distinct seasons so you have the four cardinal seasons but you always you have the transitional seasons as well so I grew up with the flavors and the smells of those seasons so um, I don't know if you've ever been to Maine but it's a very very cold place we, we talk in the Willamette Valley about cool climate varietals but I'm definitely a a cool climate varietal myself. Um, so, you know, there, in these transitional seasons, I remember even you can feel and smell the snow when it's first falling. But there's also that, that season that we used to call mud season in late March when the snow starts to melt 
And then you have that sort of crusty, sort of watery smell as sort of the, you have this beautiful earthy smell and you just know that the crocuses are going to start blooming in the next few weeks. Mm. Um, so, like I said, my family also grew up hunting and fishing and we always had gardens and um, my great-great-grandfather was a farmer in Bethel, Maine and he was also a politician in the Maine State Legislature in the 1920s and you know his big project was he secured funding in the 20s for the the first steel bridge that went over this very important river in central Maine, the Androscoggin River and we had a tradition in my family that when you became a teenager, you had to learn how to do two things in Bethel. Um, you had to learn how to drive a vehicle over the steel bridge. Um, and you had to learn how to use my grandfather's deer hunting rifle to shoot a target. And in my generation of family, we had all young women. And so my family said, all right, girls, <laughs> it's time for you to drive across the bridge and uh, learn how to shoot this rifle. Um, so. I have a lot of memories of, you know, I had um, like a, a lot of property in Maine and my stepfather had um, like a meat cooler because he was a moose hunter. And I remember going in there as a child and it wasn't scary to me because we just lived in this world, but there would be a moose without its skin just sort of hanging in this meat locker and you would open it up and the smell of the heme iron is just like burned into my memory. And so now when I sip the wines that are grown in the jewelry soil, it's nothing that I would say to a customer during the tasting. <laughs> but when I still smell that like natural iron smell, it reminds me of that. So um, I think I grew up in this really happy sort of sheltered life and my brain was really rearranged when I was in high school. Um, my aunt decided to take me for my 16th birthday to Paris. And I had never really traveled outside of the East Coast, you know, Boston or New York or Washington, DC. Um, so my parents said, yes, you can definitely go if you save up money from, for your summer job and, uh, and pay your way. So I worked at an ice cream shop every day in the summer and, and saved up all of my money. And I had enough for a plane ticket. And I felt really, really proud of that. So. Um, I went with my aunt and her best friend, and we spent a week in Paris. And I, to this day, they claim I didn't speak a word the whole time that I was there because I was just so, like, amazed by everything. I literally couldn't speak. <laughs> um, but it was incredible. We did all the things that you do as an American tourist in Paris for the first time. The museums, the Eiffel Tower, et cetera. Um, but I, I was really enamored with the cafe culture, you know, as a teenager, navigating that line between like, am I a child, am I an adult? Um, so as soon and as I came back from France, I just, you know, every fiber of my being was just like screaming to get back out in the world. Um, but I was really lucky. We have a fantastic school that is still there today called Freiburg Academy in the middle of town. Um, and it's a very, very old New England private school. So even though I lived in the, the community a few miles away from the school, I could still attend this amazing, amazing uh, private school that, that had um, people who came there from all over the world. So we had people from Germany, France, China, Bermuda, Mexico. We had an, um, people from Bulgaria, Russia, Korea. It was, it was this amazing little island of teenagers just sort of doing their thing together and learning how to be in the world, going to dances, sneaking out of the dorms, um, you know, camping, drinking beer. Uh, so I feel very privileged and lucky to have had that experience. And uh, the one regret that I have is that I didn't take French class. Um, I could have used that now in the wine industry, but I had an amazing teacher. His name was Mark Churchill, and he um, taught classical languages. So I studied Latin and Greek. Um, first of all, because it's a dead language and I'm shy, I didn't want to learn how to speak a language in front of other teenagers. So that was great. We didn't have to speak to each other. Um, and second of all, I, I really, I kind of have an engineering mind, and 
that's how I sort of got into the technology industry early in my career. So I really love just honestly translating Greek and Latin. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot of life lessons. He was one of the most popular teachers in the academy, so I love that. Um, and, you know, I also, like I said, I also was excited about getting back out into the world. And I was interested in cafe culture, so I, you know, skipped some classes and smoked some cigarettes and drank some black coffee and wrote poetry. Uh, which led me to my choice for university. So I didn't want to go to a traditional university. I wanted to get back out into the world. So I decided to go to a school called Eugene Lang College in the West Village of Manhattan. And it is part of a, a larger university system called the New School University, which is sort of an umbrella, like socially progressive school that includes the Parsons School of Design. Um, so when I told my parents I was going to leave Freiburg, never come back, I was over it, um, see you guys later, I'm going to go be fancy in Manhattan. They were very like, okay, <laughs> good luck with that. You'll probably be back for Christmas though. Um, and from the moment I got there, I was just so overwhelmed with excitement. I, I loved it. I went to school for creative writing. I wanted to be a journalist, but I was more interested in creative nonfiction. One of the best classes I ever took at Eugene Lang College was a class in oral history. And um, I, I had this fantastic writing teacher and I'll never forget, one of the first assignments we had to do was like a basic personal narrative. And it was all very small seminar-based classes. And we all read our personal narratives out loud and the subject matter was just completely terrible because we were 18. What were we going to write about? You know, the time I went to a concert and, you know, I drove the wrong way home or something. So I'll never forget what he said to us. He said, okay, listen, you know, we're here to learn the basics of creative writing. You're going to learn a story arc. You're going to learn the hero's journey. Your subject matter will always be terrible until you all have gone out and lived a real life, like gotten your heart broken, lots of disappointments, triumphs, you know, lived in different places. Um, but I took his advice very literally. So I remembered that I was in the middle of the West Village of Manhattan. So I just decided to go out and start living so I could start accumulating stories. Um, and I really love the fact that within this sort of umbrella university, we were all in the dorms with students from Parsons. And I went to school with a lot of young um, and aspiring fashion designers who have gone on to work for and found really great houses of fashion mm -hmm. in New York. And it was just a fabulous time. We started running all around uh, the Lower East Side, the West Village, the East Village, and um, there were a lot of formative creative experiences that, that um, really inspire my work with the branding and marketing and positioning of Double Zero Lines today. Um, but I took this writing teacher's advice so seriously that I realized that I would never ever get a degree if I just kept running around um, with the creative artsy folks of lower Manhattan. So I did decide to come home to Maine and just finish my liberal arts degree because the bargain that I made with myself is just, listen, get your degree, then you can go back out. And I think life is a fantastic, mysterious journey for all of us. You never know how these decisions will connect you with who you are today. Um, at the time, I felt really disappointed with myself because I did go to Manhattan with you know, my, my young ego ready to tell everybody mm -hmm. off. Um, and you know, I, I ended up graduating with a degree in women's studies from the University of Southern Maine because I found that the most talented and interesting professors at the school were all women within this program. And I lived off campus in a, in a great apartment building and a lot of my friends were working their way through school so they were working in restaurants. And that wasn't really my scene. Like I said, I was very interested in the writerly life and cafe culture. So I started working as a barista at one of the micro roasters in town and I just, I loved it. I loved everything about it. Um, so when I graduated from school, it was at the height of the economic crisis. And like I said, you know, my degree was in liberal, liberal arts and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So the natural extension of that was to really 
stay in Portland, Maine and work with this new, very interesting startup um, specialty coffee roaster. And they had some amazing ambitions and they were very, very dedicated to the craft of coffee. And I became the front of the house sort of district manager and I helped them open a number of these specialty coffee shops around southern Maine. Um, and it was very high end and very progressive for that time. And it was, it was amazing. It's not unlike the wine business really because you have you know, the, the product that you purchase directly from farmers. You have different grades of that product. Green coffee beans, you decide how you want to sort that, how you want to roast it to really showcase the highlight um, flavors and aromas of those beans. And yeah, it was amazing. I, because it was a startup and I worked directly for the founders, I had the opportunity to really do everything that I wanted to do. So um, from customer service, planning and hiring, training everybody, writing the training manuals. And I, I still am very serious about coffee. So I directly trained every barista that I hired and I'm such a pathological perfectionist that I think a lot of them did not like me. <laughs> but the customers loved me because I always made sure the lattes were amazing. But this is something that I think translates into what Chris and I do with Double Zero. I mean, I had to make sure that everything was perfect. The espresso had to be a perfect temperature. We had to have the right water filters for the water. The foam of the milk had to have the perfect microfoam the bubbles couldn't be rough. It had to have a nice silky texture. So as you can imagine, for a small town in Maine, people thought that was just a little over the top. <laughs> um, so that was a really, really great sort of prep for me working in a small business because, like I said, I had a lot of responsibility to do everything, and um, it serves me well in what I do today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, I got a little bit burned out and I was only in my early 20s because working in um, specialty foods, whether it's restaurants or coffee or wine, it's, it's challenging. It's very, very like emotionally and physically labor intensive. So I thought, gosh, I'm only 23 and my body hurts every day. So um, maybe I should just, maybe it's now time for me to sort of move on to the next thing. And I have family living in Colorado. My sister lived out there in Denver. And at the time, I was very interested in um, endurance sports. Mm -hmm. So I took my very fancy fast road bike and my backpack. And I moved to Denver and eventually Boulder, which is one of the epicenters of, um, and continues to be one of the epicenters of the sport of triathlon today. And uh, I really love that. So it's the classic story of, you know, young woman heads west with bicycle and no plan. <laughs> Here at every time. Here all the time. Yeah, yeah. But a taste for expensive coffee. So there was that. I always had to budget for that. So that's a, a bit of a culture shock, I imagine, after, after being in, in the Northeast and in New York, getting into Denver and Boulder, very, very different. So tell, tell me about that and tell me about what you kind of found there once you got there. Well, um, I... I, like I said, I really always find social, social and artistic connections in cafes. So I started um, going to Boulder every day and from my apartment in downtown Denver. And Pearl Street is the main street in Boulder. And I just started hanging out in coffee shops every day and just working freelance writing jobs on my computer. And there was a wonderful cafe, it's now closed, called Atlas. And at the time, this was in 2009, it was a very frothy startup community. So this is when, I, don't, I think Twitter had just started, Facebook was really gaining momentum, and there were a lot of venture capitalists who were looking to fund the next big thing in, in San Francisco. But there was a wonderful VC firm in Boulder, it's still there, called the Foundry Group. And they started a startup incubator called Techstars. And essentially they would fund um, small companies with big ideas and a lot of talent, typically two engineers, and they would sort of get them going with a small amount of funds and bring them into the next round. Hmm. And I had no idea. I, had, I was not exposed to this in Portland, Maine. And so I was sitting in a cafe and there were lots of young, excited, intelligent people. And I, 
I started to make friends very fast because most people in Boulder are from other places and it attracts a certain crowd of bubbly, happy, excited, mountaineering people. So I made friends really fast and I said, well, why, why are all these people here like t 10 hours a day? <laughs> and they said, well, you know, they're all, they're all CEOs and they're all starting companies. And I said, this is crazy. They all look like they just got out of high school. And it turned out that they had just gotten out of high school. Um, and I thought that was really compelling and interesting. And one day I met these two great guys who were just funded through Techstars. And they founded a company called Daily Burn, which still exists today. And this is in the early days of the iPhone and iOS. And it was the very first exercise and calorie tracker for the iPhone. And they used this interesting technology called Red Laser, which would allow you to go to the grocery store and basically scan with your iPhone camera um, a bag of Oreos, and it would tell you how many calories that you ate. Um, I never did that because it was always quite depressing to me to, to test out that product. I didn't really want to know. Um, so there were these, these two great guys, wonderful engineers from the South. They hired two engineers to help them sort of code this. But they needed somebody who would talk to customers. And they didn't have a lot of money because they, were, they had a little bit of funding, but they had this bridge to really get to the next fundraising round. So I said, you know, I really, I love talking to people. I am interested in technology and um, I, love, I love exercise. And I will work for very little money. So they said, you're hired. <laughs> um, I don't think they looked at my resume at all. But for me, it seemed kind of strange to just all of a sudden fall into this sort of technical startup world. But in Maine, my father still lives there. And he worked in sales and finance in the day. And he is a self-taught musician by night and on the weekends. And I really grew up in the 80s and 90s surrounded by my dad's musical equipment. And because this is in a very specific time, in sort of music history, and because my dad is a gearhead, we always had uh, amplifiers that were being rebuilt, pedals, he was a keyboardist, so keyboards, he would go to estate sales and buy old organs and fix them up. So he was also interested in recording, so we always had early computers so that he could sort of play around with um, recording equipment and recording on his keyboard. And still to this day, he has a studio full of all this gear. He's the only person that I know that owns a keytar, which is a guitar. You hold it like a guitar, but it's a keyboard. And he looks really cool playing it. Um, he must be the only one who looks really cool playing it. He really is. He, yeah, nobody else looks as cool as him. Um, and so when I, just, when I started working for these guys, it, working with technology really was natural for me. And I just loved it because as the product started rolling out and we would update new versions, like I said at the time, the iPhone and iOS and mobile apps, it was all very new. So each time a version would come out of the app, it, um, it had a lot of bugs in it. So all of a sudden, we would deploy a new version. And in the morning, I would have hundreds of emails in my inbox saying, you know, I tried to scan my Oreos at Shop and Save, and it wouldn't scan, and now my diet's ruined. <laughs> um, so I had to be that liaison between the customers and the developers. And that's how I really learned um, for sort of the back end of mobile technology. Um, so I thought I was going to stay in Boulder and do this for forever. But I did have my New York redemption story, because um, the company was acquired by IAC in Manhattan, I think eight months after I started working for them. And IAC is it's located primarily in Chelsea, but it's Barry Diller's digital conglomerate company. Um, so at first I was very resistant to going back out there because I really enjoyed the Boulder mm -hmm. lifestyle and I had a great group of friends. But I felt like um, leaving New York so soon as a teenager without experiencing that professional life there, um, left that story a little bit undone for me. So I decided to go back as a professional and get an apartment of my own, and live in Manhattan, and really try out that lifestyle. Because I thought, I'll never get an opportunity to, to do this again. So I said yes, and I went back out east. And, and what did you expect when you went there? 
gosh, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I, when I make decisions in my life, I just really jump in because I, I do still have the heart and soul of a writer. And so I kind of look at my life from the outside as sort of this protagonist who wants to have lots of adventures. <laughs> because I still think about that professor and I think, I really have to accumulate as many adventures as possible if I ever want to write this great American novel. So I still have a lot more to accumulate. But um, it really was that sense of adventure. I did not know what to expect at all. So when I first moved back, when I was getting my apartment on the Upper West Side, I lived in um, Spanish Harlem in a bedroom that was advertised as a full bedroom, but it really was this woman's closet that just fit a bed. <laughs> so I think I was there for two months before I found a real apartment of my own. Um, but I loved it a lot because, you know, for the first time I had the means to really experience New York and go to museums on the weekends and experience the food and wine lifestyle of the city. And it just felt really free. It was very creative. And, you know, within the IAC Corporation, there are many, many, like, sub companies. So you have Match.com, Ticketmaster, um, Gifts.com, Vimeo, College Humor, Daily Burn. Tinder ended up coming out of um, that company after I left. So if you can imagine, it was, it was a nine floor building. Barry Diller had the whole eighth floor. The ninth floor was cafeteria. And so we had, I mean, every other floor was packed shoulder to shoulder, young, creative adults building the future. Mm -hmm. And we really, really sort of drank the Kool-Aid that we were hearing from Silicon Valley because this is at the time when um, digital media was destroying the printed magazine. And New York is all about the printed, you know, highbrow publishing magazine world. And so Condé Nast was just getting completely creamed. And these traditional publishing houses and magazines couldn't figure out how to really enter the digital space. So for us, it was a very, very exciting time in this building because we felt like we were sort of the anti Condé Nast. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the energy and the ideas that were flowing between all the companies, it was, it was very exciting. Mm -hmm. But I, I learned how to be a professional there. I, I'll never forget showing up to my first day of work and when my bosses told me that we were going to be transitioning, you know, we were all going to be moving from Boulder and they were in the south and they were very nerdy. <laughs> they would tell you this themselves. They said, okay, we're not going to change anything about the company. It's still going to be all of us. We all know each other. Just, you know, he, my boss basically said, I'll protect you from sort of the corporate layers. And he did. But I showed up on the first day of work. My position was marketing and content strategy. So I had to interface with the traditional New York PR ladies. And they, they're just as fierce as you see in the movies. <laughs> So I showed up with my pink Converse sneakers and my jeans and my t-shirt and backpack ready for New York. And uh, this very, very polished PR woman came up to me and she said, this, this is not going to work. We have a corporate card at Saks Fifth Avenue. Go up there and you know, ask for this lady. She'll help you out. Um, so it was a rude awakening for me to come from a very casual startup atmosphere where we were actively like irreverent toward an establishment to oh now we are a part of this mm -hmm. um, and like I said it really polished me into a, a professional ready to sort of engage with the, the wide world so I do appreciate that. So how long did you stay in New York and what was the next step? Oh gosh, I think I was there for three years. I knew that I was not a New Yorker. This was really just my revenge trip <laughs> to prove to myself that I could be successful. And there were, like I said, there were a lot of perks working for IAC. And I remember we all got fancy gym memberships at Equinox. So Equinox is like in every city in America, there it's like the big fancy gym where they pipe in eucalyptus scent, you know, and there's like the the chill ambient music and everyone is like 
very attractive the whole time they're working out. And, and so we were in Chelsea, so I'd go to the, the Chelsea neighborhood Equinox, which was very fancy. And I remember one day stretching on this, during my lunch break on this pad, and there was a celebrity next to me doing his stretching too, and that eucalyptus smell was piping in. And I was like, you know, I, I am like an ice fisherman. I am the girl who shot a rifle at my grandparents' cabin. This is, I've proved that I've made it. There's a movie star stretching next to me. I'm in a fancy gym. I have nothing to prove to myself anymore. Um, so that's when I decided that I, wa I wanted to make a change to really live a more authentic lifestyle that was true to myself and my future. So I really got that out of my system. And I decided to move to Portland. I had never visited the Pacific Northwest before. And um, I was just really inspired by this amazing renaissance at that point, this was 2013, that had really come over to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Williamsburg, Brooklyn started copying the Portland style. So, you know, the overalls, the boots, the little train caps, the, the little restaurants. Um, and I thought, well, this is interesting. It seems a little bit overdone. I want to go to the real thing. And I did a list of like pluses and minuses and the things I really wanted in my adult sort of forever life. And, and the Pacific Northwest really hit all of those pluses. Mm -hmm. Um, so I decided to come out here. Like I said, I'd never been here before, and I moved to the Pearl District of Portland because I was very interested in still sort of living a walkable urban lifestyle that I had in New York as a transition yeah. gateway. And I'll never forget, I brought um, my belongings into storage at the Rose City Storage on the east side of Portland, and I arrived in the evening in July, and I drove across one of the bridges, and I just looked at the skyline, and it really felt like home to me immediately. And I've been here ever since. Did you have something in mind to do when you were here, or was it kind of a leap of faith? It was definitely a leap of faith. Um, my, you know, my company in New York allowed me to work remotely, but that was just until they were going to hire somebody to replace me. So that was a very sweet bridge that they gave me. Mm -hmm. um, I started working for a number of startups in Portland because that they also have a very active startup and entrepreneurial scene. At that point, I knew that I really was not satisfied working in marketing. I wanted to create products and I wanted to work with engineers because I had worked so closely with the engineers in Boulder when Daily Burn started. So um, I taught myself how to code and I started working as a software developer coding in um, Ruby and JavaScript languages at a few local dev shops, I'm working on projects for Nike, Columbia, etc. And I loved it. I loved using the super logical part of my brain. I loved the culture of engineering. And it really taught me um, a perfection that I think is a part of what Chris and I do in Double Zero Wines, because when you are writing, you can make your own decisions about language and people get creative with punctuation. But when you are writing in a computer language, if you type a semicolon instead of a colon, your program is not going to work. And um, I love solving problems. And yeah, I love the elegance and perfection that that career sort of you know, forced me into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it turned me into a more practical person from my creative dreaming sort of side. Yeah. Took some of the whimsy away. It did, it did, <laughs> it did. But I loved it. I needed, I needed a little bit of grounding at that point. Yeah. So I was doing that for a number of years and it was at that point that I met, I met Chris. Mm -hmm. And like I said, Chris and I fell in love very, very fast. I mean, he's a very charming individual and very attractive. And uh, so we just, we were together almost every day um, after we met. And like I said, I moved into our, our condo that we live in now. And we spent a lot of time um, with Chris's father. Now my father-in-law, Richard Herman, 
and they taught me a lot about their family, about wine, about the European lifestyle. And every night at dinner, you know, Richard would bring out one of his favorite wines, and he would bring out a map, he would bring out books, we would read about the producers, we would talk about the language, the history of the region. It was the most incredible crash course in wine that anybody could ever ask for. And because it was, it was tied to this like amazing emotional period in my life, I'll never forget all those great, great lessons. Because um, I think a lot of people equate wine with you know, conversation, family, the table, emotions, like a higher sort of cultural experience. And that's definitely what it was for me. Mm -hmm. So Chris, um, at the time, and still is, practicing um, at Stoll Reeves as an attorney for the, for the winery, brewery, and distillery industry. And I was still working um, as a software developer when um, the family really decided to incorporate double zero and start it, start it off. So when I, when I met Chris, double zero wines was still a, an experiment in the back, I think it was seven, a seven barrel experiment of Pinot Noir in the back room of Coelho. And when we were first dating, Chris asked me to come over one afternoon on a Sunday and I didn't know anything about Willamette Valley wine. And he said, gosh, it would be wonderful you could come over. There's there's a, a wonderful winemaker, his name's Mikey Etzel. He's coming over with the 2014 Double Zero Pinot Noir Single Vineyards, and we're gonna blend you know, the VGR. And to me, that sounded like a foreign language. <laughs> um, and it really, it really was just a kernel of an experiment. And I had no idea who Mikey Etzel was. So I didn't wanna to seem too available. And I had nothing going on that day, but I told Chris that I was busy. And uh, so I missed the opportunity to do the blending of the 2014 BGR with Mikey and Chris. And we still have a few cases of that in the library. So every time that we are able to open one, you know, Chris kind of pokes at me and says, oh, well, you didn't get a chance to blend this. How do you like it now? <laughs> and I'll tell you that wine is delicious. So they did a great job without me. As, as your sort of wine education was, was was sort of commencing here. Tell me about what you enjoyed about the education process. What was it about wine or, or wine culture that was this sort of appealed to you the most? Well, for me, it really sort of brought together all of the adventures that I had in my life so far. You know, all of the, the living in the natural world, experiencing the seasons, the smells, the flavors, the tastes and the sights, the seasonality. So it brought together nature and it also brought together arts and culture and everything that I loved and experienced when I was um, in New York. And it brought together people. The people part of my life was really in, in Boulder and, and Denver when sort of the world was opened up to me with all these amazing young folks that I met there. So um, I think for people, including myself, who um, enjoy sort of intellectual living, it's it's an endless it's an endless puzzle to to learn about and and figure out. So for me, that that was the the biggest draw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just endlessly endlessly stimulating and really bringing together all these amazing disciplines into one. And I think that's a thread that has come up in a lot of your interviews as well, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, plus it's, it's something that, that brought our family together and Chris knew, I knew at the time and continues to know everybody in the valley. So when we became a couple and he started bringing me out here, I had an instant network of everybody from the pioneers to the people that he helped get started in the 80s and 90s to the young folks who were just coming up. So. Chris Herman was like my own personal Oregon wine history archives. <laughs> um, so it was just a wonderful adventure to sort of be in a new place. I was still a new Oregonian and to be introduced to Oregon culturally through his relationships and through the people of this industry, mm -hmm. that was amazing for me. 
And I'll never forget one, one uh, date that we had out in the valley. You know, I didn't really understand that we would be going into vineyards, so I wanted to dress up and be kind of cute. So I wore high heels, but not too high. And um, we met up with Ryan Hannaford, and we were going into the Crawford Beck Vineyard. And um, so we met up with uh, David and Jean Beck, who are great friends of ours now. And I showed up in a skirt and like high heels and a fancy shirt. And Jean took one look at me. I think I was, you know, three feet taller than her. So she looked up at me and she was like, oh, honey, you can't wear that in the vineyard. <laughs> Take off those shoes, put on these Crocs. So I put on these big orange Crocs. <laughs> and she said, get in the Gator. <laughs> so Ryan was driving the Gator. Chris and I were in the back, Jean was in the front, and uh, yeah, it was hilarious. She had this amazing map of the vineyard. They drove us all around. I thought we were going to fall out because Ryan's driving <laughs> skills are quite insane. So I kind of looked at Chris like, what, what, what am I getting into? And I think every morning I look at him with the same, same sort of uh, face. What, what are you getting us into? <laughs> um, although now I don't wear high heels in the vineyard. Progress. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So as as the as the brand was, was growing, at what point did did you become part of it? At what point did it become something you wanted to be involved in? Yeah, that's a great question. For us, it really happened organically because I think Chris and his father were very intelligent in the way that they decided to build out Double Zero Wines before I became a part of it and really you know married into the family, which is we want to make the highest quality wine we possibly can first and we're not going to um, pour all of the assets into a big fancy winery with crazy equipment and a vineyard that we're not really familiar with the land we don't really know what we're getting into so um, it was very very hectic at first i didn't really think it was going to become a big business and chris I don't know if he did or not either. We thought it would be a really fun family hobby, but you know, the ph philosophy in the Herman family is very performance based. So it's like, if you're going to do something, you really must do it to the best of your ability. And it was just so exciting. I was working at a startup at a co working space in Portland. Chris was working at his office, and he was in meetings all day, and I really wasn't. I was just coding and working on the computer. So the customer calls would start coming to me and I would start answering them. And it got to the point, I think in 2018, yes, because the 2016 wines had just come out. 2016 double zero Chardonnays were really the first wines that were really in the marketplace beyond our friends and family. And we started getting calls from strangers. They wanted us to ship to different states. They wanted to know where their wine was. They wanted to know where the tech sheets were, and I had no idea how to do any of this. So I started, we have these little sort of soundproof glass phone booths in all of these co-working spaces in Oregon. So I started going into the glass phone booth every day and taking customer calls. So my boss could see me. This was another startup with, you know, five guy engineers and myself. So they could see me in the phone booth all day. And they were like, who are you talking to? And I was like, oh, forget about it. We found out that we did have this family winery, and um, one day I came home and I said, Chris, I, ha I really have to do double zero full time. And he said, well, you know, we have to wait until we're ready to make that jump. We're not really sure. He was very calculating in the business. And I said, no, I mean, you don't understand. Tomorrow I'm either going to quit or I'm going to get fired because I'm working eight hours a day on this business already. So we said, well, you, you can just quit then. <laughs> um, so that was the day that I, that I got into the wine business full time. And we never had a conversation about our roles, really. Um, what he was going to do, what I was going to do, we just naturally fell into this stride. And because I had been in this um, community of startup founders and working for startups for so long, it was sort of like a muscle that I already knew how to flex. Um, do anything possible you can in the smartest way possible to just get things done. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to do something, then open up a book or ask someone or read about it on the internet and learn. Mm -hmm. So that's really 
how we started the business side of Double Zero Wines. And I know that Chris has talked about the wine side um, in his interview, so you should all check that out, folks who are watching. Um, but um, because my strengths are really in startups and scaling businesses, marketing, market positioning, and branding, that's really how I fell into it. And you know, the brand for Double Zero Wines was very organic for us as well. We did not hire an agency to work with us at all. And you know, the colors are black and white, the brand colors. And the story about that is actually pretty interesting. I've never told this before, but I remember in 2017, no, it was March of 2018, um, we were coming back from Provine in Dusseldorf, the big, biggest wine trade fair in the world. We were um, visiting, we weren't part of the Oregon booth that year, but we were visiting as part of the trade to check it out to see if we wanted to be a part of it the following year. And we caught a ride back with um, Ernie Lozen to his house in the Mosul. Chris and Ernie are very, very good friends. And so we were staying there as guests for a few days. And in the morning, in one of his guest rooms, I opened up the window and I looked out and there are these beautiful, from the, the window has these two sort of window panels, shutters that sort of open. And then you look out and you see these two beautiful gables. And then you see the vineyards beyond that. So I just thought, this is amazing. So I took a photograph of it and I, I put it on Instagram. I think it was a black and white filter because as a writer, I'm more interested in the content of a piece, sort of like in a journalistic way than color theory. So I just started taking photos in black and white. So we went for a walk that day through the vineyards of the Mosul and they have this really amazing um, sort of cane structure that they do where they, you know, instead of a trellis, all the canes are sort of, I don't know what the term is, it's not buttressed. The canes are sort of shaped into a heart. And it's pretty fascinating because in March there were no leaves on these canes, so you could really see the heart shape. So I just walked through the Mosul taking all these black and white photos of these amazing heart-shaped canes and vines. So that's really how the black and the white branding for Double Zero came about, just thinking, thinking about the content and the amazing shapes of these photos. And just, I mean, I'm not colorblind, but um, I don't know, I'm not really good at matching. I guess I'm wearing all blue today. That's matching. This is the best I can do for you. Um, so that's really the genesis of the Double Zero Wines um, black and white brand, and we've been doing it ever since. So w as, with your experience in startups and, and, and the, the, the sort of the challenges and the, 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 the sort of typical route, tell me about what you saw when you did enter into Double Zero. What, what, what did it look like as a brand at the time, and, and what were the biggest needs uh, to start with that you, could, that you could work with? The biggest need was a cohesive story and market position. Because there are so many, many, many amazing producers here in the Valley. We've been producing wines here for over 50 years. At that point, did the Willamette Valley need another small, family-owned, detail-oriented, carefully farmed, carefully considered Pinot Noir and Chardonnay brand? I would argue no. But we were so excited as a family about the wines and people were very receptive to them that we had, we were going to turn this into a business because people were asking us to do that, but we didn't know what the story would be mm -hmm. because the story was very much at first, you know, family makes Willamette Valley wine and super pumped about it. <laughs> um, so I remember we went, out, we went out to dinner with our very good friends, um, at Davenport in Portland the night before the Oregon Chardonnay celebration. I think in 17, because I was still working at my job at the time. And they said, okay, you're going to your very first pouring event and people are gonna be coming up to your table and what are you going to tell them? And Chris and I looked at each other. I think we had had a lot of wine with our friends and we said, well, we don't know. We'll just figure it out in the morning. And our friend, um, his name is Mark Freund. He works in, um, he was, working for Silicon Valley Bank, specializing in financing for wine businesses, and now he's our banker at First Republic Bank. 
And so he's seen a lot, a lot from the inside wine businesses from California and Oregon. And he said, no, seriously, as your friend, I have to tell you that you must have a story by tomorrow because when someone comes to your table, you have to tell them something. So I think, you know, we went to bed, we thought of something to say. It was a, just about our Chardonnay production methodology and how we were really excited about the future of Willamette Valley Chardonnay. So, you know, 15, 16, moving into 17, we really changed our entire program from a few barrels of Pinot Noir to 70 to 80% of our production as we increased it slightly every year with Chardonnay. And the inspiration for that was really these great white wines of the world that Chris and his dad introduced me to. White Burgundies, Mosul Rieslings, the great wines of the Alsace. Fine white wines with balance, minerality, acid. Ethereal wines that just took you to another place. And that really was the, the inspiration for sort of chasing you know, this dream of creating that experience in Willamette Valley Chardonnay. Mm. So that's just the story we started sharing. We couldn't just, we couldn't come up with a shtick. We just shared what we cared about. And um, yeah, we continue to do that. And it really connects with people and I'm, I'm happy mm -hmm. to do that. So once again, yeah, the we had to come up with something to say at the Oregon Chardonnay celebration, and we just started sharing our, tru our truth, really, mm -hmm. and our passion and our motivation for doing this. Was there anything different about wine or the wine industry specifically than the other places, other things you'd worked in? What, what was different about it than, than any other kind of startup? Oh, a lot, a lot, yeah. Um, I've had to change a lot of my behaviors and expectations because I was working in an industry where, you know, it's not based on what Mother Nature gives you. It's not agricultural, and you don't have to work with a, an annual calendar. You can get together with smart people in a room and say, what product do we want to build tomorrow? And you could code all night, and you could launch a product the next day. In the wine industry, as you know, we have one shot per year. Uh, to do this and things have to happen on a very specific time calendar throughout the year. Not just the winemaking but um, the sales cycle, the release cycle. You know, we're about to release our 2019 wines. It's very exciting. So for example last night I stayed up until 3 in the morning writing an email t and testing our new allocation process to make sure that when I sent that email out at 3 in the morning. I knew I was going to wake up at 7 and I was going to have an inbox that was just going to be like ding, ding, ding. Um, so yeah, just really getting used to the strict timetable that you have to adhere to on the sales and marketing side to get ready for that product. So not only do you have one shot to create your, your products every year, but you create them every year. So every year there's something new and something exciting coming out. So it took me a while to get used to that annual rhythm, but now I love it. Um, and I also have to get used to the personalities and the characters of the wine industry. We are a group of sometimes ne'er-do-wells, artists, thinkers, creatives, and I think in the history of Oregon wine, there are a lot of engineers. A lot of the pioneers were engineers, so they have that engineering mind, like I do. However, you kind of come into wine to escape engineering. <laughs> uh, so I'm used to like answers that are correct and things that are perfect. And I've really had to work hard to just relax a little bit <laughs> and, and go with the flow with Mother Nature. So. We've worked with a number of amazing people in this project who have really taught me these wonderful life lessons. Um, in 2015, we had Ryan Hannaford and Leah Lafon made the Double Zero Wines. That was an amazing experience. Uh, Richard was still alive with us, and he was there to witness the 2014 bottling and the 2015 harvest. So he really oversaw everything and had a lot of philosophical questions, a lot of you know vineyard based questions and it was wonderful to participate as a family. Mm -hmm. um, in 16 we had Alban Debelieu who worked with us 
very, very passionate, very soulful, very artistic, and technically incredible winemaker. Um, and he moved on to, to work with Abbott Claim and the Angela Estate, as you know, and the wonderful folks who are working with um, Anthony Beck and the great team that he's been building in the Valley. Um, in 17, we worked with um, Maxence Leca, who came over here from France to work with us for 17 and 18. Um, and I should say the sort of overarching director of winemaker that we work with, Chris spoke about with him in his interview, is Pierre Millman, a wonderful gentleman who um, is one of the best cool climate um, wine consultants in the world. So he worked with us to really get this Chardonnay project going in 15. And so he's been working with us every year since. So we've been lucky to work with these really incredible sort of young people through that process. And uh, Albon and Max were students of his at the university in, in Dijon. So they, they all had an instant rapport with each other, which is great. For me, that process really is similar to um, the startup incubator process that I was used to in Boulder, which is, you know, you have a little bit of money to do something great. You deploy that capital very efficiently to create the, an amazing product. It's product focused and you have a lot of just young, excited, sort of hungry for the world people to make that happen. So that is something similar uh, to the startup world. Um, and then in 18, we hired Wynn Peterson Nedry to work with us, and she's our Willamette Valley winemaker. And as a second generation winemaker, she's very uh, inspirational to me because she you know, grew up in this industry and has, she's so wise, she teaches me a lot. So she helps me sort of try to learn how to relax. <laughs> um, so it's a wonderful privilege to be able to work with her and to work with Pierre and to work with Chris and have this really small team of like tight-knit superstars who all have the goal of creating something incredible beyond just the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are some differences and there are some similarities that I think that are very exciting. So you admitted that the, the need for another small Oregon wine brand when you when you launched was perhaps not perhaps not a very a big need. So mm -hmm. with that in mind and with the with the growing market, tell me about fitting double zero into that and, and, and finding it's finding a niche for it and finding customers for it. What have been the, the sort of the philosophy strategies you've developed that have been successful and, and where does it kind of find itself in the marketplace now? Yeah, that's a good question. Like I said, it really has developed organically. We didn't spend any, and continue to really not spend any money on, on marketing itself. But, you know, Chris and I uh, really thought about the great wines of the world and the wines that he's collected, that his family enjoys drinking. And we really worked backwards, not how, not the pricing and what we want to see in the marketplace, but more like, what do we want the experience to be for people all over the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, Chris has had a great career behind the scenes and it's just and he's worked with so many people. And for me it's just so wonderful to be working with him and have him in the spotlight to really take everything that he's learned and the things that he's passionate about and his personal philosophies about wine and really bring that into the forefront. So we work backwards to say, what experiences, you know, Chris, have you had that were life changing in the great wine re regions of the world. And he and his family and, you know, through osmosis as a new Ore Oregonian myself as well, we care so deeply and passionately about the future of the Willamette Valley. So we said we want to push the future of the Willamette Valley forward and we want people in high-end resorts, restaurants, wine experiences around the world to open up a bottle of double zero wines and experience the ultimate expression in its finest form from this region. And so to support that, we've had to have um, some prices that are higher. To support that, we've had to keep our team very small and very like targeted and very elite. And based on that, based on those philosophies, the right customers have found us. Mm -hmm. So 
This concept in technology startups is called product market fit. So you develop a product, you put it out there, and then you sort of iterate, not on the product itself, but iterate on the customer base to find the right customers who understand what you're going for. Mm -hmm. I remember a few years ago, we did um, something called the startup, uh, sorry, the, the small producer speakeasy in the, the parking lot of um, Pike Road in Carlton. And there were a lot of great producers who were there with us. And, but the wines were very sort of different and positioned differently. Um, and we had a great time. There was like a grilled cheese food truck there. There were lots of people who were coming in. It was pouring rain. It was a Memorial Day weekend. But it was clear to us that sort of the vision of Double Zero is sort of like a, it's not about Chris and I anymore, really. It's about a higher, it's about a higher idea that we are actually just serving, really. And, you know, there are a lot of amazing producers here. But I think the, the ultimate vision that we continue to execute on every day is to bring these um, super fine and rare wines into the world to just wave a flag to say, in the Willamette Valley, we all together believe and have expressed that this is the greatest place in the world to um, grow and make amazing Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. But our vision is to show that and prove that around the world every day. So most of our customers are not in the Willamette Valley. They're in the sort of financial and cultural centers around the world. And that's exciting because it really does sort of not prove our mission, but it furthers our mission every day. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that we can, when we can travel again, we'll be able to visit, you know, the, the great folks that are representing our wines now in Singapore and Hong Kong and Tokyo and hopefully London soon, um, California, LA, mm -hmm. Illinois, New York, and um, I don't know, my vision is just to be ambassadors in the greater world to the Willamette Valley. Because there are a lot of people who are already here who are great ambassadors when people come here. And we do want people to come here to experience what we're doing. Um, but we're sort of looking at it rather than like a, a pull, as more of like a push out into the world. So all of, the, all of the branding and marketing position sort of backs into that greater goal that we have. What have been the, the sort of key milestones for, the, for you and, and, and when you look at the brand so far? And what, what are the next ones to come as you look ahead? Gosh, I think everything that has happened as a milestone is something that has been kind of a surprise to us because we really just work hard every day to translate this mission. I think the first time we got some some like press and critical recognition for the 2017s was a great surprise and it really you know showed the world that what we're trying to do is something worth worth looking at and worth tasting so i remember i was lying in bed in portland when we got our first um great scores from one of the critics and chris was making coffee like he does every morning like a great husband for me so i was just in bed looking at my computer and um you know, I just screamed. I was like, oh my God, because nobody tells you when press comes out. And Chris thought I, you know, had injured myself horribly. <laughs> so he came running into the bedroom and he said, what's going on? And I said, oh my God, this is crazy. Look at this. I couldn't really believe it. So I think for us, a big milestone was the first, like, critical recognition of what we were doing. Um, and I think another big milestone for us was launching our wine allocation last, last spring was our first shipment at the beginning of the, the pandemic. We had already planned on it. We already had our first club signups. So we packed and we packed the wine here in this living room. We got it out of the warehouse because we couldn't go into warehouses. Um, you know, I was here with our small team wearing masks, wearing rubber gloves, like sanitizing everything, packing these boxes thinking, 
like trying to smile, you know, like we are shipping wine to people, definitely, this is awesome, right? <laughs> um, so I think that was a great sort of personal triumph, getting through this sort of early pandemic as a small family business and sort of pivoting around business models, trying to understand how to still keep our wines in the marketplace, especially internationally when all of the, all of the global logistics are continue to be jammed up. Um, I think that's the true test of an entrepreneur, which is it's, it's easy when things are good, but the true test of a great entrepreneur is what you do when things are difficult. And we have amazing winemakers on our team. I'm not going to pretend that I am the winemaker. They're great at what they do. I'm, I'm, I'm the entrepreneurial type, and so it's really my job to make sure that our business is sustainable and and grows. So it's been a tremendous challenge. So that's been a, an interesting milestone. Um, but Chris and I have flexed our, our entrepreneurial muscles together. And I feel proud of that, that we've, we've done that together as a couple. Mm -hmm. And for the future, um, you know, our, our goal is to stay small with our Willamette Valley production. And we do have a project in Burgundy that we are growing very slowly. And Pierre is making that wine for us there. And we have a wonderful project in Champagne with the Lenoir family of Champagne Paul Lenoir. And we've been doing that since 2016 altogether. We've gone over there and done the dosage trials together. We love working with this family. But we have not completed the packaging. So all of the bottles are just still resting quietly in their cellar. Um, so for me, I'm really personally excited about the champagne project because for us, it's, it's a Blanc de Blanc champagne Grand Cru. So we really are interested in furthering the dialogue between Grand Cru Chardonnay in Champagne and Burgundy. And we don't have Grand Cru here in, um, in America, in Oregon the Willamette Valley, but we work with some of the very, very best vineyards that I think, I guess we would consider to be in the Eola Amity Hills. So just furthering that dialogue and furthering the positioning of Willamette Valley as, as not just a like quirky Portlandia style place, but as a place, and that is why I love it, but as a place where um, we not only have the farming and the raw materials to create this incredible experience, but I want people, when they open up a double zero Willamette Valley wine, no matter where they are in the world, to just say, wow, and to have an emotional experience. So as long as we can continue with that, then that is, that's success to me. You talked about 2020 a little bit already, and of course the, the timing of your initial uh, allocation. Tell me about the rest of 2020 from your perspective. Um, as things were kind of happening, what were the decisions you had to make? What were the pivots you had to, to, to deal with? And what were the sort of the, the silver linings to come out of the, the last year and a half for you and, the, for, you and for the brand? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think number one for me is logistics and logistical challenges. So. Um, We've always been strong in the DTC category for Double Zero Wines because of the nature of our collector base. Um, people who buy Double Zero tend to want to uh, purchase them for their own sellers and enjoy them at home or bring them into restaurants rather than having an on-premise or off-premise experience. So we were very strong in DTC already, but it just grew because I don't know about you guys, but uh, Chris and myself and a lot of people we knew were saying, no matter what you're into, whether it's beer, wine, spirits, ice cream, you know, hamburgers. Um, oh, last year, the, the theme for everybody I know is open the good stuff. So we felt very blessed and lucky that people considered our wines the good stuff. So we just started shipping like crazy. Um, so it was, logistics was a, was a big challenge. And um, the growth of DTC is fantastic, but it also came with a lot of um, just a lot of studying, studying the markets and studying the, the costs and the patterns, etc. And keeping everybody safe during harvest was a big, um, not challenge, but um, 
very, very important to us. We make our wine at the Carlton Winemaker Studio. Uh, it is a communal space. Um, everyone has their own bonded winery there with their own winemakers and their own barrels, products, etc. But we are all in the same space. So Chris and I um, were not really allowed in the winery last year because they did not want any, you know, like, quote, unnecessary people who are not actively, you know, racking and pressing in the space for safety reasons. So it, so we're in our home in Carlton, which is about a half a mile from the winery. So it was very hard to sort of sit in our living room on our hands, knowing that all the action was happening a half a mile down the street. That was a big challenge. Um, but uh, for a silver lining, it brought our team definitely closer together. Um, it definitely brought Chris and I closer together as a married couple to navigate these challenges. And it made our D DTC program a lot stronger. And I felt like I personally was in a better position to not be romantic about the way things used to be. So because of my startup background, so just like I said before, flexing that muscle to say, OK, the world has changed since yesterday. We all have to stay at home. We, all have to, we still have to ship wine to people. And they want the wines now because they need some comfort in this crazy world. So the silver lining, I think, was just understanding how strong Chris and I are as entrepreneurs. I think that was a great silver lining. And learning, getting to know Wynn better and learning about how deeply strong she is as a, as a woman, um, as a woman, as a person, as a winemaker, and as a farmer. So yeah, those were fantastic silver linings. And also, all of our customers were at home. So we had a lot of great Zoom tastings and a lot of great phone calls where we just really got to know people. Mm -hmm. And it was a hard year for everyone, so I think everyone was a little bit more open and emotional. Mm -hmm. So rather than a 1,000. Uh, like list members, we have a thou literally a thousand friends, and I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there were definitely some silver linings. What about as we look ahead now? You mentioned a little bit for the, sort of the future of Double Zero, but mm -hmm. as you look ahead for yourself and, and for the brand as you look into the future, what, what are you hoping for next? And, and what are the sort of upcoming projects or challenges that you're, that you're taking, taking a look at now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that one of the, the most exciting things that is happening presently today in my inbox is we're, we're going to be fully allocated with this 2019 release. And that, that is sort of an exciting prospect for us um, with our small production lines. I think for me personally, I'm 37 and a half. Um, so I really am still in the infancy of my, you know, adult life and career as a woman in the industry. And I'm very, very inspired by the leadership of um, Veronique Druen and Eugenia Keegan, Keegan, Allison Sokol Blosser. I mean, when, like I said, these are, and there are amazing women who have been a part of the industry in history. I mean, the Vuv I mean, she navigated crazy times in, in uh, the history of Champagne, and she really made the region what it is today. Um, so for me, I just want to continue personally to evolve in this business as a professional and to always be on the leading edge of business. And I never want to rest on our laurels to say, Great, we got great scores last year. High fives, everyone. Let's you know go drink beer in the backyard. <laughs> uh, Chris and I are on a relentless pursuit, and we will always be pushing forward. Um, for me, I would like him to retire from his law practice so that he can relax a little bit, um, so that he can enjoy you know telling all of his stories and, and teaching people about the history of the industry and wine and the world and his perspective the same way that he taught me about that um, because he works awfully hard. So I would like him to retire and I would really like to continue my role leading the company mm -hmm. so that he can, he can have his own glass of wine once in a while, I guess. Yeah, so I really want to strengthen my relationships with the great leaders 
in the industry in 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 different regions mm -hmm. um men, men or women mm -hmm. and uh yeah just continue to learn as much as i can For, wh how would you, uh, from your perspective, what does the Oregon wine industry sort of look like today? Uh, obviously, you're, you're, like you said, you're still fairly new to it, but you, you're, you have a pretty good idea where it's positioned. Tell me, tell me what it looks like today and what its future looks like from your perspective. I think we're experiencing an amazing, amazing revolution, really, in, in business practices and winemaking styles and young people coming into the industry and more diverse people coming into the industry it's so exciting and i've studied a lot of the stories of the early pioneers and a lot of them are celebrating 50 years this year which is so fantastic and all of those people were forward-thinking pioneers david lett was forward-thinking the people who founded um, oregon pinot camp were forward-thinking they said we have to bring people here and show them what we have here. Mm -hmm. The founders of the International Pinot Noir celebration were forward thinking. And these were all these were all major, major like tectonic moves forward in what we're doing in the Willamette Valley. And right now to me it seems like we're in the middle of this next big, huge push forward. Um, not only because there are more like young people coming into their own and starting projects, but because there's just a, a tremendous opportunity with the growth and development of communication and, and digital media and um, the growth and development of direct-to-consumer. We can not only talk to consumers directly via our iPhones all day, every day, we can also ship wine directly to them overnight Mm -hmm. uh, FedEx if we want to do that so there are people who are coming in who have had other careers in the past such as myself who are bringing in new and fresh and forward-thinking ideas and what what will those ideas be and how will they play out we'll have to do this again in 50 years I'll be 87 I don't know how old you'll be <laughs> um, a little bit older than that, a little bit older than that. Um, but um, I don't know what that is going to turn into, but it just feels like there's a lot of exuberance and, and energy. We live in a great community. Um, for example, last year, no, two years ago, um, I had a wonderful morning with Chris. We went to go eat blueberry pancakes at the community plate. And Steve Dorner was there, you know, with his family having breakfast, the first table in. And I had to ask Jessica Cortell a question about an organic spray in the vineyard. We were getting close to harvest. And, and um, we couldn't get a hold of each other. She was there getting coffee, so I was talking to her. I mean, we are, we are not changing in a way that is, that is getting rid of this amazing community feel. We're all, I mean, the Willamette Valley is a magical place. I love living here. It's, it has that small town feel. And I feel like the Willamette Valley is like a stage and we're all the cast of characters playing our roles within it. Um, and there is a lot of space for people to come in. What I would like to see is more professional training with entrepreneurship, business, accounting, management. I think that's what's happening now. We're maturing as an industry, so we really need people who understand international logistics, international marketing, clientele, travel, digital media, and what that means, and how people are looking at the Willamette Valley at all hours of the day on their iPhones. So um, I guess my final comment about that is uh, I'm really excited about what's happening um, at Linfield, specifically in the Evanstead Center for Wine Education. I loved that interview with Grace. It was really wonderful. She said some really important things about how we really need to start training the next generation of, of folks, not just in winemaking, but in all these other professional business services. So I think that's, for me, that seems like the next big move that's happening. And it's exciting because that means that there are so many, so many more doors and jobs and positions and opportunities to get involved, mm -hmm. not just in the tasting room or in the cellar anymore. Agreed.
And, there, and there's a, with all the new projects, there's a lot more wine to drink. There's so, so many more wines to taste, which I'm personally excited about. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just think everything that's happening at Linfield University is, is very, very important. Um, there are some wonderful people in the industry who went to school there. Jean-Marie Fourier was there. Um, the, the gentleman from the wine house, Glenn Knight. Mm -hmm. Glenn Knight, um, the proprietor with his brother and his father of the wine house, a very important wine store in LA, um, went to Linfield University, back then Linfield College. And he has a wonderful affinity for the region. And he sells a lot of Willamette Valley wine there. So I really appreciate Linfield University as sort of like the bedrock of the future uh, training and education of the region. I love that. We're just we're blushing over here. That's very that's very exciting. I could tell <laughs> through your masks. Um, I truly believe that, though. Well, that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here that we should have covered? Um, not really. I mean, I just want to uh, express once again my um, gratitude to be in the mix here in the industry. I never, you know, from the first day I came out here with my inappropriate short high heels into the vineyard <laughs> until now. It's been a wonderful journey um, and I hope to continue that and a lot of people have taught me a lot of fantastic lessons so I'm still absorbing that and my big goal is to be able to pass that on when I've learned enough to do so and for anyone who's watching this please drink Willamette Valley wine, come visit Willamette Valley. It's, it's an amazing place and we all look forward to raising a glass with you. <laughs> So thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having us here and for, for sharing your story with us. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Thank you.